Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be here, even if by video, at St Hilda's again. In the autumn of 1955, Joyce Mitchell and I came up to Oxford as first year students at St Hilda's, then a women's college only, to read philosophy. We had much else in common. We were both American and we both held first degrees from other institutions. Joyce had graduated from Bryn Mawr, small and select women's college with high standards on the east coast of the United States. I had held a scholarship at the University of Frankfurt, awarded to me by the University of Chicago, the home of the famous Great Books course initiated by Robert Hutchins. I had taken my BA at Chicago after two years. As both Joyce and I had first degrees, we were permitted to live outside college. So we joined forces to sally forth and inspect the available college digs in town. We soon found some attractive flaps in a college owned house nearby in the Ifley Road. One flat in particular, we thought, was especially spacious and light, and as it was designed for two, we decided to share it rather than choose among three other singles in the building. We were delighted at this outcome. I came to realize over time that this was owing not just to the circumstances, two new girls from abroad making common cause, but to Joyce's own personal qualities, to her openness, her warmth and her sincerity. We were already friends. Another story from our early days as students will show how she dealt with the wider social world of Oxford. One day when she was walking up the high street, she was accosted by a student unknown to her who apologized for his rudeness in approaching her on the street and simply introducing himself. He explained that he was a member of the Dramatic Society and was directing a play by one William Shakespeare, namely Antony and Cleopatra. The play had several women characters and so he hoped to recruit some actresses from the women's colleges, as of course at that time his college, Magdalen, had no women students. In fact, they were passing Magdalen just at that moment it's just over the bridge from St Hilda's. And he pointed out that they were planning to have an open air production in the college gardens, which he thought would do very well as the Egypt that was the play that was the play's main setting. Would she have any interest in joining them? Joyce was a bit taken aback and protested that she had no acting experience or expertise upon which the director explained that he had a particular role in mind for her, that of Cleopatra's servant. Now Joyce might well have been taken aback or indeed offended at being spotted on the street as suitable to play a serving woman in Egypt. She now knew why this young man had approached her on the street with no introduction or previous knowledge of her or her possible acting skills. He wanted a black servant for the Ptolemaic queen in a play. Acting experience or talent was not what he was after. But Joyce did not become angry. On the contrary, still protesting her lack of acting experience, she agreed to give the role a try. After that, as rehearsals began, I heard a good deal about the play as Joyce made the role her own and I of course went to the opening night in Magdalen Gardens, a fine sight in itself. She is charming and of course has the brilliant scene in which Cleopatra, defeated, threatened with being taken as a captive back to Rome and paraded through the streets, asks her servant to bring the poisonous asp so that she can kill herself. 
Joyce was admirable in the role. There was a good party at the end of the run and the bold student director who accosted her in the street became, not many years later, an illustrious director in the National Theatre. This was characteristic of Joyce. She never treated any gesture as merely insulting or based on prejudice, bad judgment or ill will. She never lost her temper that I saw. Those who condescended to her, she turned into genuine friends. But this goodwill on her part was accompanied by an unswerving determination to claim and gain equality, to right wrongs, to turn aside prejudice, to change minds and hearts. She often spoke of her father, a clergyman, and I believe that she followed his precepts and his example. It would not be too much to say that for his daughter he was a kind of Martin Luther King. Once in later years, back in America, I visited one of her classes. It was on Plato's idea of justice, a well-known theme, and one could see it come alive for the students. Even while she was in a privileged and protected position as a student at Oxford, she attended to what she saw as an obligation to her people. This trait, I believe, came to the fore in her later work for Howard University. The welfare of her people rather than her own career was a prime motivation. Our academic courses proved more divergent than we had expected or hoped, as Joyce was reading PPP, Philosophy, Politics and Psychology, whereas I was reading PPE, Philosophy, Politics and Economics. And PPE then was organised in such a way that the first two terms of study were taken up with economics and the 19th century history of Britain. I learnt a good deal about welfare economics and the moving history of Ireland. Philosophy, however, I learnt about through my acquaintance with Joyce and with John Searle, an American student who had stayed on in Oxford and gained his DPhil and a teaching post at Christ Church. I was enabled to visit some philosophy seminars which were occasions for brilliant displays of wit and ingenuity on the part of the then young faculty. But my initiation into philosophy had been in Germany, where the tradition of lectures by individual professors engaged in formulating their next weighty books was still dominant. To me, the greatest philosopher in the West had been Kant, who was a minor presence at Oxford. Like Isaiah Berlin, who on coming to Oxford from Eastern Europe, in the late 1930s, had perceived that to follow his own interest, he must give up philosophy and become a historian of ideas. I had to turn elsewhere and instead turn to English literature and old love well served at Oxford and at St Hilda's. After Oxford, I returned to the States to do a PhD at Columbia in comparative literature. Joyce, on the contrary, was able to find what she needed and wanted in Oxford's PPP course, which enabled her to return to pursue her PhD in philosophy at Yale. She thereby became the first black woman in the United States to gain a PhD in philosophy, a remarkable achievement which was still celebrated at Yale at the time of her death with a conference in her honour. Even just now, we found, in seeking an appropriate lecture for the Joyce Mitchell Cook lecture series, which we are inaugurating today, that black women philosophers are a rarity in any country. We can only hope that Joyce's example and that, that of our first Joyce Mitchell Cook lecturer, Professor Anita Allen, together with some new student bursaries we have set up at St Hilda's will help to encourage many others 
to come forward. Thank you and welcome.